Hello, everyone. I'm Christy Oliver, the Professional Development Manager at Davis Publications. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Today, we are thrilled to have the authors of Focus on Photography, Kathy Monahan and Herman Joyner with us. They will be showcasing contemporary photographers working with subject matter as a point of entry. But before we get to that, we have a few quick housekeeping items. We would love for you to ask questions throughout our time together. The best way to do that is to type your questions into the chat box or use the Q&A button. Both can be found at the bottom of your screen. We'll be monitoring these throughout the session and we'll get to as many questions as we can during our time together. Also, just a reminder that we are recording this session and after we finish today, a link to the video will be emailed to you and will be available for viewing at davisart.com slash free resources for anyone who might like to watch. Next slide, please. Kathy Monahan has a master's in curriculum development with a focus on creative arts and learning. As an elementary art specialist, she developed a curriculum for integrating weaving into the classroom. This became the book, You Can Weave, published by Davis in 2000, which was edited and photographed by Herman Joyner. Herman Joyner has 40 years of experience in commercial and fine art photography. He has studied with John Sexton, Maury Cami, Don Worth, and Olivia Parker. He has a master's in professional writing and has won multiple awards for both his photography and writing. Married for 33 years with one child and two grandchildren, Kathy and Herman lived in Portland, Oregon. And now it is my pleasure to pass it over to Kathy and Herman. Thanks, Christy. Um, can we have the next slide? Thanks. Um, after moving to Portland about 20 years ago, I started working in marketing for a textile company, which was kind of a great um, synergy with my background in textiles. And also it was a great, um, a great entry point for working with commercial photography as I got to oversee and art direct photo shoots. Um, <clears throat> you know, it also keeps me current in the field. You know, I still teach textiles one night a week with adults and I do have my personal weaving as well. And in addition to being a photographer and a writer, I also worked a retail job selling cameras for several years and was for a time the photographic web content editor for the second largest photo retailer in the world. I also taught photography for several years at a nonprofit art school and was an adjunct professor teaching college level technical writing and composition. So our connection with Davis goes back a couple of decades now. And, um, you know, I loved using the materials and all of the, the Davis produces in my classroom. You know, so it's, we're really thrilled to be with you today to, at the start of this new year, coming to you live from our tiny gallery in our hallway in Portland, Oregon. And, um, you know, we see our role as subject area experts and we're not in the trenches every day like you are. But, so we would defer to your classroom expertise, but we want to be a resource for you. So next slide. So what we'll be talking about today, you know, with the contemporary photographers, you know, you can start anywhere. You could say, oh, we're going to talk about art photographers. We're going to talk about commercial photographers. But basically, you have to start somewhere and everybody has to point their camera at something. So we're using subject matter as an entry point. But since, you know, all of these overlap and we understand that. So a photojournalist might be taking portraits also, or they might be um, actually reporting on uh, something to do with landscape. So there is an overlap that we'll talk about. The other thing we'll talk about is their approaches, their point of view, their tools, and the outlets. And by outlet, we, we mean, where would you see their photos? Are they somebody who's exhibiting, somebody who's publishing? <clears throat> or somebody who is uh, doing interactive work. So that's what we mean by outlet. Um, and then, you know, everybody works in a certain time. Yeah. So it's important to remember that uh, all the artists are always working in the now. And because of this, artists are always either responding to or reflecting current events. Um, at the same time, artists remain connected to the past even while they are shaping the future. So we'll be talking a little bit about, you know, maybe starting points um, from looking at this work of where it might wind up in your, in your lessons. And then at the end, we'll talk about where you might find new inspiration for yourself or your students and some resources. So next slide, we'll look at the first artist. Perfect. 
Okay, Felicita Maynard uh, is a New York-based, first-generation, Afro-Latinx American interdisciplinary artist and educator, and they have a BFA in film photography from Brooklyn College. And just a point of clarification, uh, Felicita's preferred pronouns are they and theirs. So as we're speaking today about their work, um, we might uh, inadvertently use the wrong pronoun. So um, apologies at the beginning, but this is a good example of, of inclusive language and also representation. And since Felicita's work is based on gender and identity, it's really important to um, respect those pronouns. So as we get working, as we're moving through these slides, there, we'll do our best. Um, next slide. So one of the primary concerns of Felicita is to um, look at um, the past and refer to the past by using uh, alternative processes in photography. Uh, they studied uh, film photography at Brooklyn College, and what that means is that um, they looked at and used um, handmade emulsions, uh, such as wet plate, collodion, and tintype photography. Uh, the first few images we're going to look at is Felicita making tintype images, and this is an attempt to connect you know, current events and current people uh, to history and past times. And it's interesting that Felicita is the youngest artist we'll look at, but using the oldest materials, the oldest techniques. Yeah. So next slide. Next slide. So Felicita's photography really presents an imagined past with images that present queer black people. Uh, this is their way of rewriting history to be in more inclusive of all people. So the first, the first um, images were tintypes, and you know tintype we're seeing as being more and more interesting to people, and we're actually seeing that pop up in fairs. You might see somebody with a booth, and you can have a tintype made now or for events. So this very old process is coming back and being um, pursued by younger artists. Yeah. Next slide. This is a, a body of work that um, called Old Dandy the Tribute. Uh, in, and it is their series that honors and references the pioneering queer African-American drag king entertainer Florence Hines, who performed across the US from the 1890s to the 1920s. Uh, next slide. Uh, Florence Hines and other performers uh, like her created and performed as the character of the Black Dandy. And this was, um, which was trying to elevate the popular cult culture representations of the Black man following the Civil War. Hines blurred lines between race, class, and gender in new unexpected ways. And Felicita Maynard is following in their footsteps. And this is an example of, you know, representation and if what you don't see, you can create. And so um, back in those times of having positive um, representations of both uh, black characters and um, queer characters. So um, next slide. Another uh, area of interest for Felicita and, and many other artists in, uh, today is trying to change the, how the black body is represented in media. Um, this is them trying to take control of how they are themselves being represented. Um, this particular image is of a maternity portrait. Uh, that Felicita has done. Yeah, and you see the masterful work with lighting and that uh, those deep tones. So, you know, taking 
the elements and principles of art and also of lighting um, to, you know, real, showing real facility. But the other thing that um, is important about Felicita is they've co-founded um, the Support Black Arts. So it's an organization that supports and promotes Black artists. So their Instagram feed is at Support Black Art. And if you go there, you'll see about, there's about a quarter of a million followers that now, and there's about 3,700 posts. So you have a great resource for seeing um, the black, uh, black artists and also uh, what's contemporary right now. So uh, next slide, and we'll talk about the next artist. Susan Bean is a graphic designer, book designer, photographer, writer, editor, and educator living in Portland, Oregon. Um, in her own words, quote, I've always been an art kid, but I couldn't draw what I could see in my mind's eye, unquote. So she turned to photography. She has a BA in fine art photography from Goddard College in Vermont, and she has taken classes from Ansel Adams, Minor White, Aaron Siskin, and Paul Caponegro. She's taught photography and journalism to high school and college students, and she's also a master in Adobe products like Photoshop, Illustrator, and InDesign. Uh, one thing that I'd like to point out with this particular image um, is, you know, she works in, in two main categories. The first one we're going to look at is her portraits, and a lot of these are spontaneous portraits. Um, this was a, a person that she met while riding a train and uh, struck up a conversation with him. And over the course of the next few minutes, uh, she then, after talking with him, uh, she asked to take his photograph. Um, the resulting uh, intimacy of him, you know, being so physically close to the camera, but being so open um, is a very unique look. Uh, most times when photographers want to photograph strangers, basically, um, it's a more voyeuristic look. And this is anything but that. So of having your students um, establish rapport with their subjects is so important um, in order to get something that's so engaging and pulls you in so well. Next slide. The other thing you might want to uh, take notice of is, in this example, is how it, much it looks like Felicita's work as far as the actual appearance of the image itself. Um, and that's because uh, Susan is trying to duplicate the look of um, tintypes in wet plate collodion. So, and she's doing this not with using tintype process, but uh, in fact, since 2013, she's been an iPhone photographer. Um, she's only used an iPhone as her camera. Um, nothing else. But with her use of Photoshop, and, um, and we could go to the next slide. Uh, with the use of Photoshop and also the use of apps on her phone, uh, she's able to duplicate the look of tintypes and other alternative processes. And just a note about apps, we, we never are fans of you know, Instagram filters and things like that that are just uh, one click and you're done. Um, that can, it can be so cliche at this point, but being able to use um, either apps on your phone or Photoshop filters to create a look that you're interested and in, control it and you be in charge of it is a great option for your students. And that mastery is so helpful in terms of career work. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's not, we're not saying, you know, to click on the app and make it look old, but absolutely to be able to, to manipulate those. So yeah. uh, next slide, we're gonna look at, um, at Susan's self-portrait. So you might've noticed in the first image, um, our first slide, you, you might've noticed that Susan is um, bald. So she has been shaving her heads for, head for a, a couple decades now. And, um, and those glasses, she has these decorative frames. It's very striking. So she has these whimsical portraits that sort of combine still life, fashion, 
and self-portraiture. And so she balances things on her head or um, uh, if you look at the next slide, there, um, I don't think these are balanced, but they might be, or she could be laying down because sometimes she'll lay down and things will be stacked to appear as though they're balanced on her head. Mm -hmm. But this has got a great um, connection with fashion and with Irving Penn's uh, uh, pictures. So this is such um, a fresh look at self-portrait and it's, it's great in terms of being um, out there. This is who I am presenting yourself um, as a character within your own portraits. Uh, next slide. This one is my favorite. Also reminds me of Irving Penn and just in general about, um, reminds me of great fashion editorial. There's also this great um, kind of irony in terms of having her beautiful clean head with rollers and um, so those round bright circles uh, they are then repeated in the round glasses and her very round eyes. So this is a great example of just embracing the way you look and then going for it. It's a, a very strong self-portrait but also uses color and repetition and the, the positive and negative shape um, that those make. Yeah, and, and as far as what apps Susan might be using, I suspect that she's using the Hipstamatic uh, apps uh, and specifically the Tintype app. So next slide, the next artist. Okay, Griselda San Martin is a Hispanic photographer. Um, she was born in Spain and now lives and works out of New York City. Um, for the most part, um, well, she has multiple degrees in business, business administration, both a BA and an MBA. Uh, she has a degree in documentary photography from the International Center of Photography and an MA in journalism from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Um, for her work, uh, San Martin has focused on the issues of immigration, deportation, inequality, and human rights abuses as it pertains to identity and the sense of belonging. Of particular interest is the U.S.-Mexico border. And the first few images we're going to look at is uh, from the wall, which is uh, the images from uh, the border wall between San Diego, California, and Tijuana, Mexico. And a lot of people would assume, uh, you know, there's that kind of um, traditional photojournalism that's sort of gritty and black and white. And here, you know, you see the same, um, we, we have, she has a great use of color. If we look at the next slide particularly, <clears throat> this is the same subject of the wall, but here you have that beautiful rich color, the pops of the primary, and then using those repeating shapes where you we're actually coming in as the first person, the first shape touches the next, touches the next, and then the wall. So it's as though we're reaching in and touching the wall ourselves. The um, color, the shapes, and that that strong diagonal bring us in and right into the wall. On the next slide, you see the use of um, really strong textural elements and the texture of the wall has created um, well a physical barrier but then also visually we have the parents who are on the other side of the wall have become just shadows with the um, the daughter on this side of the wall uh, we can actually see her so you know of using those uh, the contrast between textures and that um, the, the dominance of that in the, in the frame is really strong and sh helps to create that barrier and that feeling of disconnect. Next slide. Um, part of the, um, the direction that Griselda has taken in her work is to really highlight uh, little seen or little known populations within our country or uh, in Mexico. Um, this first image is part of um, the Mexican Muslim uh, phenomena, which is as the Catholic faith declines in Mexico, uh, people have turned to Islam um, 
and they've blended the Mexican and Islamic traditions in, in their daily life. And again, you see those pops of color of the beautiful um, pink of her, of her shawl and her um, scarf juxtaposed against the bright color of the food truck. Uh, next slide. Another um, little known uh, population or um, in this case religion is the Santa Muerte uh, religion and uh, Griselda has photographed uh, a body of work of these of the people that follow Santa Muerte in New York City and this is an offshoot of the Catholic faith that blends traditional Mesoamerican representations of death with Catholic iconography. Santa Muerte is a female skeleton version of death. There are one to two million followers in the U.S. of Santa Muerte with 10 to 12 million followers in the rest of the Americas. Next slide. And this is uh, the Garifuna people, uh, which claim their heritage from enslaved Africans who survived a shipwreck off the coast of St. Vincent Island in the Caribbean Sea in the 1600s. Uh, these survivors intermarried with native people on the island and blended their traditions and beliefs together, creating a new and separate culture. And there are 100,000 Spanish-speaking Garifuna living in New York City today. And here you see again that beautiful use of color. Here it's very subtle, but really beautiful and rich. But you know, for me, this is an example of how how do you um, document those hidden cultures around you? And is it that your students are part of some um, small and under um, exposed um, subculture? Like I had students who did who were Native American students that were dancers, and um, those kinds of beautiful important elements within your students and your own uh, lives and how can you how can you record those and uh, document them share them and this is also a good example of uh, blending portraiture with photojournalism exactly in a yeah. really beautiful way yeah. next slide Jim Lomason is a freelance photographer and photojournalist living in Portland Oregon he has a, a BS in art, and he's had more than 50 one-person exhibits. Uh, his work has covered a lot of different things, and, and most of it has gone into exhibits and books, published books, um, ranging from uh, the boxing subculture in the United States to um, the survival stories of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. Um, in what we carried, he's looking at the stories of refugees from the Iraq war into the United States. Next slide. So what he's doing is uh, blending still life photography with photojournalism. He finds people that, have, that are refugees in the United States and ask them, you know, a really basic, simple question. Um, what is the one thing you couldn't leave behind when you fled your country? And a lot of these, you know, people actually fled uh, wartime uh, events and would have been killed if they had stayed. So they, you know, share the one thing that they brought with them that survived the journey and uh, Jim photographs it rather simply and sparely on a white background and then makes a print, brings it back to the people to see, and they're allowed to write on the print their reactions or memories or just their feelings about the objects and what happened to them. And, you know, we were at uh, the exhibit of this work along with a talk with uh, Jim and, and in the audience were many of the people who had participated in the project. And so the, it was profoundly important to them. And you know, the addition of their story in this brings it to a different level. Um, next slide. 
you can see that each time um, he makes a print and each time somebody interacts with it, they're actually collaborating on the finished image because where they place the words, what words they use, how the words look, um, all of those are complete collaboration in terms of, the, of artists. Now you can't always read the words because sometimes they're in another language, but um, often you can and that brings you another level of understanding because it's hard when you think, oh, well, you know, everybody will get my work, right? I just need to hang it. It needs to, to speak for itself. Artwork never speaks for itself in, my, in our opinion. You, the artist has a responsibility to uh, convey that what they did mean. And how you do that is, is there's many layers to it. So this is layering on meaning, layering on um, interaction. Also, in terms of how this work is portrayed um, or shown, if you go to the next slide here, you see an example of how different the, the words can be placed and how different that um, then looks. But you know, these were large prints in a gallery, but then it's also sold as a book. So you have two different kinds of experiences as you interact with the work. You can sit in an intimate setting and look at it, you know, privately with the book or in a gallery where it's large and expansive. So um, those kinds of how the work is shown also has a big impact on how it's received. Yeah. Next slide. Richard. Yeah, so uh, this tradition of, of combining writing with uh, photographic images goes back quite a ways. Uh, Jim Goldberg in the 1970s uh, created a, a body of work in a book called Rich and Poor, where he did portraits of both poor people and rich people around the San Francisco area you know, showed them the prints and let them add their own comments to the images. And what this does is that it, it just adds more context for the image. And also it's a recognition that the photographer is trying to tell another person's story mm -hmm. and enlisting their help to do that job. Right, and how, how might your students, um, how, that, how might that work? Would they have somebody else write on there? Would they, you know, the kind of the um, default is Photoshop, type it in. Mm, maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you want to do something more actually physical of have them interact with the, the print itself. So that's an interesting idea, but also the idea of adding something very meaningful rather than uh, sometimes rather trite, can be rather trite, trite quotes that are combined with images lots of times commercially. So having something bring these layers of meaning in. Next slide. Here's an example of um, the words you, most of us can't read because it's not in English. However, how much did it bring to this image to have this uh, calligraphy, this beautiful writing added to the picture? Now the story is and you know it's pretty obvious that it's probably an artist because it's not um, it's not typical to have so much paint for an amateur. But this was an artist who had to flee, and he was a, a very famous portrait artist. And this was all he took with him, and it was a very meaningful act for him. He spoke about that at the opening of being able to represent that experience. Yeah, and it also just uh, I, I think this body of work is a really good could become a very good prompt for students to reflect and think about incorporating into their own artwork or dealing with other people in that uh, what is, you know, what object is, holds the most importance for you as a person, you know, what object says the most about you and how you would interpret that or include it in your artwork. And so many of those examples were very simple objects, but they had so much meaning. There wasn't um, treasures. Um, there wasn't jewelry. There wasn't any of those things that were simple things, a teacup, paint. Yeah. So, next slide. Um, if there's an adage in, in art or um, of any sort is that you should do what you know. You know, uh, writers are told to write what you know. Uh, photographers photograph what you know. Um, in the case of Ansel Adams, who was a landscape photographer, he was really known as, you know, the photographer of Yosemite National Park. And the reason that was, was because he 
lived for many years in a small house outside the park. And every available moment that he had was spent hiking and exploring the park with his camera. William Neal is kind of the modern equivalent to this. He's lived just outside Yosemite National Park since 1977. And he's been photographing the park on a regular basis ever since. Um, and like a lot of uh, landscape, traditional landscape photographers, you know, he's, he works with uh, large format cameras at the beginning and making, you know, sharp prints with fine detail throughout. That's a picture of him with Ansel. Ansel's got the hat and the beard. Um, so yeah, you know, that picture of that grand landscape there, that traditional black and white is what Ansel made famous. But, um, you know, William Neal takes it a step, a step aside. So next, next slide. So what you see uh, changing for William Neal in his approach to landscape photography is the inclusion of motion and movement. Um, in this case, it's a still image of a tree in a field, um, but there's these white streaks going across the image, you know, from uh, through the entire image. And what this is, is that he photographed this during a snowstorm. Uh, so with the longer shutter speed, it actually captured the snowflakes as white streaks going across the image. So in one image, he's able to, you know, include a variety of different um, aspects. Um, there's the weather, you know, there's movement, there's color, um, there's the shape of the tree. It all comes together. And you know, here we we basically have subject movement uh, creating a blur or an effect in the image. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Here's another example of subject movement. Yeah, where it's a picture of the sky and the lake, and the the shutter speed is long enough, probably minutes long, so that the movement of the clouds is slightly blurred uh, in both the sky and the lake. And there's an example of, it's not that he doesn't know how to, you know, get that sharp image, but of, of creating uh, almost an impression of the landscape as well as a record of it. So we have this beautiful impressionistic landscape that, that creates like the memory that you would have had seeing that. The next slide. Yeah, and Ansel Adams, um, one of the, his thoughts about photography is that each photograph is a representation of what you felt at the moment you made a photograph. And that's really what uh, the photographs of William Neal is about. It's more about than just capturing what was in front of the camera, but it was also trying to capture what he felt and experienced at that time. Um, with the newer work that he's doing in the last 10 years or so, um, it's a part of a, a small kind of niche camera movement or photography movement called intentional camera movement. Okay, so what this is doing is that during the exposure, the photographer is moving the camera to create a certain amount of blur. In this case, he's moving the camera of these, you know, the shot of the dunes, he's moving it from left to right and making a horizontal blur. And to me, I look at this and it's like, oh yeah, I've been in the dunes and your eye goes side to side. And also there's that movement of if there's any wind, that the, the, the skimming of the sand along horizontally. So that um, aspect of representing the experience as well as what's right there, that second, is combined in this, in, in William Neal's work. Next, next slide. And here we have uh, redwood trees, uh, which are very, you know, strong vertical objects. So his choice is to move the camera during the exposure up and down, uh, which lengthens the details of the trunks of the trees. And it again reinforces that upward looking. Um, now when, you know, when your students are accidentally moving their camera, that's not the same thing of having camera movement being a blurring effect or blurring side effect of um, of not having the camera locked down or not 
um, not propping yourself against a strong um, support. So we're not suggesting that you just say, oh, you might try moving the camera around, but being doing it thoughtfully. Let's look mm -hmm. at the last slide for William Neal here, is very impressionistic view of trees also. And that um, is anything but accidental. You can see the camera is moving up, up and down, reinforcing the lengthening, the, um, the height of the trees and the, the, um, the, the trunks themselves. So, you know, that's something that your students might explore thoughtfully. So how do you uh, use blur in your work? Are you letting the subject move across in front of you with a long shutter speed and having it blur? Are you panning with the movement? So it's blurring the background or are you um, freezing everything? You know, so that, that aspect of camera movement and subject movement is very, very interesting and can be a really evocative um, effect. Yeah, and we do want to point out that in the digital edition of uh, Focus on Photography, uh, there was a video lesson on treating uh, subject movement and subject blur in much the same ways that uh, William Neal is using these techniques in these images. Yeah, you just don't usually see them in the, in the, in the landscape and something very unique right. with William Neal. Next yeah. slide. Daniel Baltra is another Hispanic photographer. He was born in Spain. He currently lives in Seattle, Washington. He has a degree in forestry engineering and biology, and uh, he has worked for the past 20 years as an environmental uh, landscape photographer, and his work has taken him to all seven continents in the world. Um, Documenting, documenting the changes and, and the uh, events that he's witnessed to. And it's one of those things that I think is awesome about photographers is that they bring uh, more than photography <laughs> skills to, to their work. So his background in uh, forest engineering and biology is reflected in his work as a photographer. And you see that often where you bring something more to the work. So do your students have other interests that they would then explore within photography? Next slide. Uh, one thing that you uh, will notice right away with his images is that they're from a very uh, high point of view, uh, uh, what we would call uh, in the textbook, um, the bird's eye view. And he's literally in a small plane above these uh, scenes, uh, photographing out the window um, to, get, to achieve this look. And what it does is really just um, kind of creates a different point of view, a higher point of view, and also tends to kind of render the landscape in kind of abstract terms too. Yeah, so beautiful composition here and using the contrast of the texture of the water inside and outside of that um, that barrier that's collecting the spill, and then also the the color contrast. Um, next slide. One of the things that's new now is that we have more access to drone photography and having. Um, more people have this point of view. So in the past, that would have been out of out of reach of most people. But you know, if your students are using drones, or if your school has drones, just you know, you would be uh, familiar with making sure that your county and local area, all the rules, there's that varies from place to place drastically. So you want to be aware of that. I've um, employed drone photographers um, for a lot of different projects, and it's a new field that is open open more and more. It's um, Everybody's using drone photography for all kinds of purposes. So it's something that your students might um, be interested in as a, as a profession. Next slide. This is an amazing um, example of really exploiting uh, contrast in textures and in color. Here we have the deforestation and the forest shown in one in one um, image. And you know, Herman pointed out when he saw this the first time, it looks like a crime scene of having that felled tree there in that barren landscape. Um, very very provocative, very um, strong image, and then a strong diagonal again with a high point of view of abstracting it in a way. Yeah, and just contrasting elements, the forest versus the bare ground. Yeah, next slide. This also is using contrast 
really strongly and shape um, of having that lush green and in the midst of that, that deforestation and the bare ground and the dead trees. So of using that to make a real strong point in his, um, he's, he's, he's quite an editorial photographer as well. So um, this is a, a great example of that. Next slide. Yeah, and, and this is um, a really kind of inexplicable uh, image at first when you look at it. it you know, you just, when you discover that that's actually a boat sitting in the middle of, of bare earth, um, you know, it begs the question and, and what happened and how did it get there? Um, but the answer is, is that with the deforestation and the drought that's happened in the Amazon, uh, this was a lake or a river at one point, and the changes happened so rapidly that it left the boat stranded in the middle of nothing. Um, next slide. This is our last photographer we'll speak about. And this is Chris Graves, and he's a commercial and fine art photographer working out of New York City in London. Um, he has a BFA in visual arts from SUNY uh, Purchase College. Um, he's exhibited widely um, in the National Portrait Gallery in London and the University of Arizona in Tucson. He's also the Vice President of Photography for the Architectural League of New York City. And his commercial in clients include The Gap, uh, New York Magazine, Nike, Samsung, Sony, um, he was also a staff photographer for the Guggenheim Museum uh, for a number of years. Um, so his, his work, you know, really, like a lot of photographers and artists, you know, it in, encompasses a wide range of commercial ventures, as well as he leaves a place for his personal work. So here's a commercial shot on this first slide and looking at the next, um, we'll be looking at uh, two other series and these are more personal work. So next slide. This is part of the Testament project, which is uh, Chris's exploration of the representation of contemporary black experience in America. Uh, it's a collaboration actually between Graves and the subject with Chris allowing the subject to choose the color of the lighting. The and, next image. And in this way, uh, control of the images is given back to the subjects in the photograph. Um, and this is part of, in the same way that Felicita was interested in, in showing and taking control of how black bodies are represented in media. Uh, Chris Graves is also, that's the whole point of this particular project. And for me, it also, um, I, the idea of having the subject collaborate with the photographers is, is so intriguing and having that, um, inviting that would be a great, a great collaboration. Yeah, and it really makes a, a, a for a different investment of the subject in the final picture too. Yeah. It's such a, um, uh, you, you're so exposed when you're photographed. So it's, um, it's a way of bringing the, the subject into the process. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, this is a part of a body of work called The Bleak Reality, which is a series of eight images made at the quote, exact locations where unarmed black men were murdered by police officers, unquote. Um, Chris Graves made these images in eight consecutive days, traveling across the country and photographing each one each day. So this first one is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and it's where Alton Sterling was killed. And it has such a mundane quality. Um, you know, it's just a snapshot in a way, but what is layered in there is what happened there. Uh, next slide. And this is where Philando Castile was killed um, at the Minnesota State Fair. Next slide. And this is where Eric Garner uh, was killed on Staten Island. 
So these are examples of bringing um, a, layer, a layer of meaning in, um, into a place. So do your students have a place that they know of where something important happened? And I, we're not talking about these catastrophic events, but was there an important place in their life that they want to record? And then how do they layer that meaning in there? This is part of a, you know, the context of those eight images is very important and the time they were done and uh, what happened there. But what other kinds of, um, of, of moments do they want to record? Yeah. And, and this is also, um, as we referred to at the beginning, um, this is Chris Graves' response to current events that are happening right now and continue to happen, unfortunately. Yeah. So that's that aspect of you're photographing in this moment in time, and that is reflected in your work. Yeah. Um, in, in either in a way that you plan or not, it will, it will be in your work. So that wraps up our um, survey of a few of our favorite contemporary artists. Uh, next slide. Wonderful. It looks like we have some time. We can take questions. So if anyone has any questions, please type them into the chat box or use the Q&A button. Both can be found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And let's see, there was one question early on about, it seems like many people are in a hybrid or a remote learning situation um, for the start of the school year or even beyond. Do you have any suggestions on apps that they should or could use or how to in, in a general, even in a general sense, how to adjust for remote learning? Well, you know, everything can be done digitally, you know, in terms of the kinds of all of these could be digital. And so they could be shared um, either in a Google Doc, you know, every school has different right roles. And we're big fans of Instagram, but we know it's blocked in, by many schools. But if they're working remote, if they would have a shared feed, a shared hashtag, so that people can see each other's work, dedicate a hashtag to your school name and your, uh, maybe your, um, your class number. Um, and that would be, that's also our recommendation for you in terms of finding inspiration is um, is Instagram is our favorite source for mining um, great work and what's happening now of mm -hmm. uh, create your own Instagram account that is curated and you pull everything out of there that isn't your favorite thing and then when you log on to that account you see inspiration and new work and follow great great artists and great hashtags so those things will be served up to you. But for your students working remotely, I think that you know every single thing could be done um, on a, a very simple on with a with a, a camera phone. Um, yeah. And so of sharing them though on a Google Doc or sharing them, um, you know, if you can use Instagram on a shared hashtag, I would say. But you know, also if you know, in terms of alternative processes, I think the um, the cyanotype paper, you know, of being able to expose it at home. If you have sunshine, Portland isn't the sunshine capital of the world, but there are a few days a year of um, of being able to do an alternative process like that. Yeah, and, and most of the uh, well, the available cyanotype papers is developed in just plain water, so it's you know, it's no chemistry for the most part. Um, and pretty safe to use. Okay. So if you would like, we have a chance to win a copy of the School Arts Collection Media Arts book, which has a really great section on digital photography. All you need to do is share your favorite photographer inspired lesson by Friday, August 28th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, and don't forget to tag us on social media so that we can get you entered and pull a winner. Next slide. Please also watch our social channels for announcements about our upcoming webinars. Our next session will be on Tuesday, September 15th. We will have Davis author and Art21 Senior Education Advisor, Joe Fusaro, 
who will be speaking about how to utilize meaningful questions to drive lessons and units of study that positively affect both teaching and student learning. He'll be sharing techniques for using contemporary art to engage students in an active viewing and engaging students in the artistic process. You can sign up at davisart.com slash free resources. Um, at that link, you can also find um, all of our weekly webinars. You can sign up and watch any of them that you like. You can sign up for a free trial of the Davis Digital Platform, access free professional development sessions. You can read School Arts Magazine online and view some of our on-demand video lessons. We've also put together some really great resources on equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as teaching art online. A really big thanks to Kathy and Herman for joining us today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share with us this afternoon. And thank you to everyone who's joined us. We hope that you found the session inspiring and insightful. We're going to stop the recording now, but we'll stay on for just a few minutes longer to answer any burning questions you may have. We hope that you all stay safe and healthy, and we hope to see you again soon.